All right, in this video, we are going to continue coding the renderer horizontal class. We're going to need to address a handful of topics. These topics will be drawing the tracks, positioning the staff itself, drawing track titles, and handling a problem called time scaling, where we'll be able to adjust the distance between each individual note as well as the speed at which the notes cross the hit line. Mm -hmm. So, beginning at the top, we need to address the drawing of individual tracks. Now before we worry about the visual positioning of the tracks themselves, we need to make sure that we're looking at all of the possible notes, at least the topmost and bottommost note, so that we make sure our tracks are lining up properly. So before we get into anything inside of the renderer, I'm actually going to jump to Beat Generator, where we are currently using the generator for Beat 3, and let's add some crash notes and some uh, ride notes to this rhythm. That way we'll have all the notes filled from top to bottom. So what we'll do is we'll duplicate this first if statement where we're drawing eighth notes. Matter of fact, we will duplicate it. Actually, we'll duplicate it one time for now. Let's drop in a note, every dotted quarter note, and the type of note will be on track zero, so the very first track. Now we'll take and duplicate this set of lines so that we get a note, once again, every dotted quarter note, this time on the last note, track seven, or the eighth track, which should be our, our excuse me, our ride. Mm -hmm. Now let's jump in and test to make sure that we are getting notes all the way across the board. So here in single player, there we have green notes at the very top and blue notes at the very bottom. So now I have a better idea of how tall our staff is. Another thing I'll do is inside of our game screen, when we're generating the beat, let's actually generate four measures instead of just two. That will give us some more time to watch as we're watching all of our notes go across the screen. All right, now that we know how tall our staff should be, we can begin drawing our tracks. So here inside of the horizontal renderer, let's go and jump up before our hit line, right under the span y variable, and let's put together a new loop. Let's loop through all of the tracks. So we'll put together for loop with an index variable as i, and let's look at track names to find the total number of tracks. So we have config.tracknames.count. Now, we need to find the position, the screen position, for each of these tracks. And we'll do that using the get staff position method. Now we're only interested in the y position, so we'll store an integer called note y, and we'll set that to be equal to get staff position, and we need to feed in the information for get staff position so it can do the positioning resolution. Mm -hmm. For tick, we're not worried about tick. These tracks are going to span the entire width of the screen horizontally, right. so we'll give a tick of zero since we're not even going to store the X component that comes back. Now the track, that is important. We're looping through all of our tracks one by one, and each track will be represented by the index variable I. So we can plug I in place for the specific track. And finally, get staff position needs the current song, so we'll pass that along as the song parameter. Now once again, we're only interested in Y, so we'll actually look at the Y component returned from the vector two of this column, now this y component is a float. We're, we need to store this information in an in integer, so we will cast this result to int before storing it, and that should take care of our casting. Now, we, we have this value called note y, and the problem with note y at the moment is it is centered on the actual note itself. We need to offset this so that the track is drawn above the note texture, not in the middle of it. So I'll make another variable called track y, and that variable will take our note y and it will offset by moving up, so we will subtract the notes origin. So we'll grab note origin dot y. Once again, we're in a scenario where the note origin is a float, so we'll cast that note origin to an int before we use it in the expression. So now we have our track values placed on top of notes instead of through the middle of them. Now we're ready to put together 
a call to draw in order to get everything placed on screen. So we'll make a call to sprite batch dot draw. We'll draw these tracks using our fill texture, which is style dot fill texture. And now we need to assemble a rectangle to represent this track line. So we're going to have a thin line, actually we're going to have a one pixel line that fills the width of the screen horizontally. So we'll make a new rectangle where the X component is zero. So we begin at the left side of the screen and we progress, let's see, our position in Y. Now the position in Y is important. So this is our um, location that the track is drawn. Mm -hmm. This is going to be track Y. Now our width is going to be the entire screen width. So global state dot fixed drawing width. And our height is going to be one. So just a single pixel. Yep. And once we have the rectangle assembled, we can place a color for the track line, and that's going to be given by style colors dot track. So now with the color in place, we can finish off the call to draw. And now we should be able to run and test the result. So now we can see that we do have track lines. Even though it's hard to see, we do have one up at the top, even though it's uh, right now butted up against the gray of the window itself, so it's hard to right. see. But there is one problem at the bottom. If we jump back out and into the game, you can see that our ride notes don't have a line below them. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense since with eight tracks, if we draw eight lines starting at the top of each one... We'd be one short at the bottom. Exactly. It's like counting the gaps between your fingers. Exactly, yeah. It's the same type of problem. Now, in order to solve this, all we're going to do is loop for one additional iteration. So we'll loop for track names.count plus one. So get, by giving ourselves an additional track, we now have a line to fill out the bottom of our staff. Gotcha. And once again, this is actually where our span Y comes in, where span Y is the staff height minus one instead of two, since this bottom track line is actually just past the end of the staff. Mm -hmm. So that way we don't have to take it into consideration when we're calculating span Y. But looking at it one last time, we do have all of our tracks being drawn with notes inside of each track, and everything seems to be centering up nicely. All right, moving on from here, we need to put together some s positioning for our staff, because right now it's snugged up to the very top of the screen, which gets in the way of the BPM readout and makes the top track harder to see. Now what we want to do is, in the end, when we're playing a multiplayer, we'll have two different, we'll have two staffs. One will be, up at the, one will be on the top, one will be on the bottom. So we would like to imagine dividing the screen in half vertically mm -hmm. and then placing the top staff in the middle of the top half of the screen, the bottom staff, in the bottom, in the centered on the bottom of the screen. Okay. Now this gets a lot easier to see if we can actually visually divide the screen in half. So I'm going to put a temporary draw call here at the bottom of our draw method inside of the renderer. So we actually have, we'll give ourselves a line dividing the screen in half vertically. So we'll make a sprite batch draw call and we'll stretch a line across the screen dividing it in two. So we'll give ourselves a, let's see, we'll look into style and grab a fill texture. We'll make a rectangle that spans the screen. So we'll make a new rectangle with our X set to zero a width being the total width of the screen, global state dot fixed drawing width. Actually, what are we looking at here? This is the Y component, not the width. So there, we'll space that out. That goes in the width. We need something for height. For height, we'll take the height of the screen and divide it by two. Global state dot fixed drawing height divided by two. Now we'll jump to the end. We need one more component for the height of the rectangle. We'll leave that be a value of one. Now we'll drop in a color to make this easier to see. So place a color dot yellow, and then finish off our draw call. So now if we run the game, we have this yellow line dividing our screen in half. Gotcha. And we can see that we're not matching the half. So we're, in this case, we're only concerned with the top half because we're not addressing multiplayer positioning yet. 
Right. So looking at the top, we want to take this amount of space, divide that in half, and apply it at the top and bottom of the staff. To do that, we'll jump into our get staff y method, and we'll put together a return for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our global states, fixed drawing height, and we're actually going to divide that by 4. And then we're going to center up the actual staff on that. Since the staff is currently aligned to its top, we need to add an additional offset of staff height divided by 2. So half the staff height. Exactly. Now the idea with staff fixed drawing height divided by 4, if we were to imagine there we can see that it's not positioning correctly. We have our top and bottom divided. So kind of what you've done is you've drawn like three imaginary lines right through your entire interface, and you've centered up your staff on the topmost line. Exactly. Um, we could probably show that by doing one more yellow line just to show, because what, what you're saying is correct. But if we put another line saying staff height divided by four, now we can see that mm -hmm. this top dividing line is now the center of the staff itself. So right. we've centered the staff on this top most And line. where I got that three imaginary lines, if you pictured the bottom half of the screen also divided in half with another yellow line, you'd have three yellow lines cutting through. Exactly. If you did the same thing down here, then we'd have everything divided up. You could count the space in quarters then, sure. quarters of the screen. But we do have our staff lining up nicely now. So we're done with these temporary marker lines. We'll pull them out entirely. Now we can turn our attention to drawing track titles. And this is going to come in two parts. First part is going to be gathering the positions for our titles, and the second part is going to be drawing. Because once again, our track titles need to be drawn on the tracks themselves, and it's here inside of our track loop that we decide where the tracks are placed. Then it's down here after this for loop that we need to draw the individual titles. So beginning up here in our tracks loop, let me also drop in a comment just to make it easier to see what each section of code is doing. Mm -hmm. And we'll say that this is going to be our tracks section. Now, in order to get the position of each track, what we'll do is we'll jump in here right after our call where we were drawing the individual tracks. And we'll take the track position into account. We'll actually take the note position, because the note position is going to be the center of the track rather than the top. But in order to center up the text, we also need the height of the text itself. So once again, we can do a rectangle centered on a rectangle calculation. So before we can center the text, we need the dimensions of the text. So we'll make a vector2 called text dims, so text dimensions. And then we'll use the font itself to measure the string. So style dot font small. And we'll tell that font to measure a string. And now we need to pass in the name of the current track. We have all of the names currently stored in config dot track names. We're looping through the track names one at a time so we can drop in track names sub i. That finishes off the call to measure string and that should have the position stored in text dimensions. Now at this point, uh, bonus points to anyone who sees the problem that's cropping up with our indexing, but we'll get to that when it becomes a problem. <laughs> now that we have the height of our text, we're ready to place the text centered onto the current track. And when we store this position, we'll be storing it into the title positions array. So we'll take title positions, sub i, and we'll set that to be equal to a new vector2. Our x value is going to be very easy since we'll have all of this text left aligned. We'll give ourselves 10 pixels of spacing off the left side of the screen. Now our value in y is going to be based on our note y. Because if you remember, the notes themselves are uh, placed around their origin. Mm -hmm. We can see that they are currently centered on tracks. So note Y is actually going to be, you can imagine a line drawing through the middle of every track. Now we need to take into account the uh, dimensions of the text, so we'll subtract from this. Because if we drew it as is, we'd be drawing the top left on the center of the track. So we'd actually have our text positioned too low. 
if we move the text up, we can subtract text dimensions, text dims dot y divided by two. So half the height of the text, and then store that back in title positions. Now if we try to run at this point, we'll, we should hit a bit of a problem. And to show that, let's jump in and simply run and cause the problem. If we try and jump to the game, we get an exception. Down here inside of our text dimensions, we're actually getting an exception here on track names because we're trying to access element 8 out of a list that has only 8 elements, meaning the valid elements would be 0 through 7. Mm -hmm. We're trying to grab 8. The reason we're trying to grab 8 is we're looping for an additional item in order to get that last line. So that means we need to omit the last line when we're gathering our title positions. So I'll hit Shift F5 and terminate the debug session and place these two lines of code inside of an if statement. We'll say, only if we are within range for our track names will we try and place a track name. So if i is less than config dot track names dot count. So if we're still within range of an actual track that we can address, then we'll store the position in title positions. So now if we run the game, everything runs and we get no crash. Nice. Now it's time to put this title positions array into effect and draw our titles on top of our notes. So we'll jump in here right below our notes loop. We can drop in a comment to say that this is going to be our track titles. And now we can put together another loop, a new loop, and that's going to loop through all of our title positions and draw a track title at the specific position. So we'll make a for loop, an index variable of i, and we'll loop through all of our title positions up to the end of length. Now, to draw each title, we'll grab our sprite batch. We'll tell it to invoke the draw string method. We'll specify the font small for our font. So we'll give style dot font small. The text is going to be stored still in config dot track names. Since we're looping through track by track, the track index is given as the variable i. And the position is going to be stored in title positions, sub i. Finally, we have a color, and we can look that up by looking into style colors dot track title. Alright, so all of this call put together, that should take care of the track titles themselves. So let's run and test the code. So jumping into the game, we can see on the left we have crash, hi-hat, snare, all of our toms, our kick, and our ride. Very nice. And all of that text is centered on the track that it belongs to. So that takes care of track titles. Now there's one last topic to address in this video, and that is the topic of time scaling. Now what we're going to do with time scaling is begin by noting the distance between each of our notes. Mm -hmm. You can see that eighth notes are placed rather close together. Mm -hmm. Now, for the purposes of our song editor, we would like to be able to visually represent all the way up to a 30 second note mm -hmm. in order to give an effective editing grid. At the moment, if we leave the notes spaced how they are, there will not be enough room to place 30 second notes without the note texture overlapping. So the idea is we want to increase the possible gapage so that we don't have to have little tiny thin notes. Exactly. Gotcha. And another artifact you'll notice of spacing the notes out is that we are not changing the speed of the song. We're not changing the tempo. Mm -hmm. That means in order for the notes to be spaced farther apart but still play at the same rate, they'll visually move faster across the screen. Yeah. So let's put this value together, and let's set up this time scaling value in such a way that it's configurable. Okay. Because let's say that once you get all this put together, you decide that you really want enough spacing for a 64th node in edit mode. 30 mm -hmm. seconds not enough. You would need even more spacing. So we'll make this completely configurable. To do that, we'll make sure that we jump into our content project and load up our config XML file. Inside of config XML, we'll add a new node directly below hit range. We will add a node called time scale. Then we'll add a value attribute. 
and we will call this attribute, or rather we'll assign the value 1.5. Then we'll end off the node. Now we'll do the same thing we did with hit range. In order to make this accessible, we will add a time scale field to the config class. So we'll jump into config.cs. We'll drop in right below our hit range. As a matter of fact, we can duplicate the hit range line, resulting in public static, and then change the name. We're going to have time scale. We will also change the type from an integer to a float in order to give ourselves more accuracy. Okay. Now we need to make sure we load this value up inside of load options. So here inside of the load options method, we'll duplicate the hit range field. Instead, we're going to be loading into the time scale field. We'll be parsing a float instead of an integer. And the node name is time scale. Now, just as we're doing with any new configuration parameters that we're adding, We'll set a breakpoint so we test it and make sure we are indeed pulling the value in. So with a breakpoint set on our time scale line, I'll run the game. We'll immediately drop out and hit the breakpoint. We can see that time scale is currently zero. If I hit F10 to step over, time scale is now a value of 1.5. Okay. So we are successfully loading this value from the config file. Now does this technically mean that we're moving our notes in numbers that aren't quite pixels? That's true. As a matter of fact, it's not that we're moving them in non-pixel values, since they're integers that correlate directly to pixels. Mm -hmm. What we're introducing is a bit of rounding error, since okay. our notes are always going to land on a specific pixel, and our scale could describe a value that is sub-pixel in nature. Right. But when that actually gets calculated, our get staff y is going to be uh, casting to int. Okay. So we'll simply be truncating the floating point information. This will result in the appearance of rounding errors. Now, visually, one-pixel rounding errors aren't going to be noticeable to the human eye. Right. Except, Especially while the notes are moving. Exactly. So we're not going to worry about that as positioning. There is a special consideration with our cursor offset that mm -hmm. we'll have to take into account to make sure that we don't get any jittering with the notes. Okay. Because there is a point at which this, you could almost call it an aliasing error, because we're going into a scenario where our floating point describes a value more accurate than the integer itself can describe. Mm -hmm. And there is the possibility that our notes could jitter as they're moving if we calculate their exact uh, pan position, their exact uh, cursor position, individually, note by note. We could end up with rounding errors that are different per note, and then the notes could move a little bit pixel by pixel in relation to each other, and that would be noticeable to the human eye. Okay. So we'll make sure that the approach we take prevents any note by note jitter. All right, to put our new time scale value into effect, we need to jump back to our renderer horizontal and move up to our get staff position method. The time scale is going to be applied to our position in X. What we're going to be doing is taking our tick and multiplying that by time scale because right now our tick values are mapping directly to pixel values. Mm -hmm. Time scale is going to give ourselves the ability to scale that offset. So now we're going to have, what's the word for it, a different, you could say two different resolutions. We have native tick resolution, sure, and then we have a transformation that is taking place in order to map that tick to the screen. So we'll take our tick value and we'll multiply that by our config dot time scale value. And we'll make sure that we continue to offset by our screen center. Of course, this results in a typing compatibility between float and int. So once again, we'll take the entire expression and place it in parentheses. And cast it out to int. And then cast that to int before storing it in x. Now, if we were to run the game, we would see everything with our position scaling, but we wouldn't be adjusting the speed. So if we run now, we can see that everything looks correct. But if we were to place our sound back in... So I was going to say, what's playing back? Well, nothing right now until we uncomment this line inside of our game <laughs> screen. Let's, uh, let's see if... Now, granted, this may be a little bit hard to tell at the recording frame rate. Mm -hmm. But just so that, as we look at it here, we can see what result we're getting. So, interesting drum beat in its own right. But notice that. 
the music stopped before the notes stopped. Exactly. So we're moving our notes visually at a different speed than they are being played. In order to account for that, we need to make sure that we take the cursor, because if we scroll down here to render or horizontal and then look in our draw method, we are currently offsetting notes. Scroll in a little bit more, we have our notes section. And each note position is offset by the song cursor. We are no longer mapping notes to direct pixel values, so a tick no longer equals a pixel. That means this cursor is going to have to be transformed in the same way that the actual positions are. Now, in order to accomplish this cursor scaling, we're going to go up to the very top of the draw method, right underneath span Y, and we're going to put together a series of values. One, that time scale value itself is going to be useful to later code, so we're actually going to copy the time scale value to a variable. We're going to make a local time scale variable and then we'll copy config dot timescale just to keep it handy for future use though we can use it here immediately in our calculation for time for a scaled cursor mm -hmm. the scaled cursor is going to need to be an integer value since we're going to be describing all of our note positions in terms of integers and so this is really the first place that you could have a bit of aliasing inaccuracy where we're going to be truncating the floating point result. So we'll make an integer and we'll call this integer scaled cursor. And the value will be song dot cursor times time scale. So the same transformation that's taking place with our ticks inside of get staff position. We're simply multiplying a tick value by time scale. So again, the cursor is in terms of ticks, so we're multiplying a tick value against time scale. Now, of course, time scale is a float, resulting in a float from the expression. So we'll do the same thing as we did before, put the expression in parentheses, and then cast to an integer. So we've casted and stored this result in scaled cursor. Now we have a cursor value that will progress at the same speed as our new note positions. So that means down here inside of notes, we can take our note position dot x and decrement by scaled cursor instead of by song dot cursor. Now if we load up and run the game, we should see the visual positioning matching what we hear. So we're getting a lot of fun with that obnoxious right. crash. <clears throat> it's probably going to be a little hard to see. But once again, this time, watching the notes pass the hit line, the sound stopped at the same time as the last note crossed. Yeah, we didn't line. have those graphics just continuing to trail on, so something's got to be lining up. And if we jump back, and at this point, I'm going to turn off the sound since we verified that we are matching the actual sound. We'll go back to screen game, comment out our line inside of note play. Just to point out one thing, if we're watching really close, the notes seem to be positioned very solidly one to the next. There's mm -hmm. no jitter in place. Right. The danger for this jitter would come in here inside of our individual note positioning, if we calculated the scaled cursor using get staff position instead of once by itself, meaning if we factored this, the cursor into note.tick, because that seems like that would be more convenient. We wouldn't have to have this externally scaled cursor if we offset the note tick before we ever pass it to staff position. The problem with doing so is we'll get rounding errors on a per note basis. And the idea is that each note could shift back and forth relative to its neighboring notes, and that would be much more visually apparent than a single rounding error that is held consistently against all of the other notes. So we'll make sure that we calculate all of our notes as though they were static, and then apply the same panning value as scaled cursor to all of the notes in the same manner. And that way we'll have nice solid note positions as they're sliding across the screen. So with that, We've got tracks, staff positioning, and even time scaling implemented, so that is going to take care of this video.